So the United States Department of Defense currently occupies roughly 29% of the land mass on our island. Um, and so they control 35,938 acres, which is about a third or about 31%. Um, and that is more than all private landowners combined. They also control more land than our local government of Guam. So the scale is very huge. And so of course, with the land space comes all their different development in terms of the bases and its capacity militarily. How much military might and you know power is actually kept on this base? You know, and has it got a has it got nuclear? Does it include nuclear weapons? That is the magic question. And if we were to ask Department of Defense folks, they will deny it. But um, there's a couple of historical things that indicate that we probably do have nuclear weapons. Um, in particular, when you look back at the detonation of the bombs um, that aimed at Hiroshima as well as Nagasaki, those bombs were actually stored and contained on the Mariana Island of Tinian. And so Tinian doesn't have a base, so of course naturally you would wonder where did those bombs come from? Where was it contained? And that's, you know, Tinian is only several hundred miles from our island. So very close, and we do have nuclear submarines. That's been confirmed and expanding. Um, so part of the recent base buildup is to increase the size of berthings uh, to create the slots for the different submarines, the nuclear submarines. Guam is referred to as a number of things over the years. Um, the most common is that we are the U.S. Uh, tip of the spear of U.S. military might. We've been referred to as the U.S.'s unsinkable aircraft carrier in the Pacific. We've been referred to as America's trailer trash of the Pacific, and so we will no longer be the trailer trash because of all this rapid investment, because of the expansion of the bases. And so um, when you think when you look at what is it exactly that we house, I mean, in my estimation, it's a little bit of everything because of our strategic location, which is really our greatest blessing, but also in the case of militarization, our worst curse. Um, and because we're such a crossroads between the East and the West, um, and so grants U.S. Uh, Department of Defense military very easy access to the East. And so um, for that reason, um, there's a little bit of everything stockpiled on our island. Um, in addition to that, um, as a U.S. territory, which is akin to that of being a colony, a modern-day colony, um, they really don't have to consult our government on anything, and they can continue to do uh, as they wish in terms of their military plans because we lack political rights as residents of a territory. And so for that reason, um, the expansion has just been exponential all around. Has, has there been any tests through elections or referendum of, of whether or not there's any consent from the local people for this, this military base at any point in time? There hasn't been any formal referendum of any type, but as part of the U.S. Department of Defense process, um, is what's called the NEPA process. And so part of the NEPA process is uh, having hearings and what have you where people put input. And so as part of the draft environmental impact statement process, um, there were hearings that were held throughout the island. Initially, there's scoping hearings, and then they have hearings during the time of the release of the DEIS. And in those hearings, there were, and this is according to the Department of Defense, there are over 10,000 comments that were submitted. Coming from a community of roughly 157,000 people. So proportionally, you can see the massive outcry of the community. Um, and of course, the responses primarily um, addressed issues of environmental protection in, in terms of safety, in terms of contamination, uh, preservation of the culture, um, continued land dispossession, right? So there was a whole myriad of things that people were concerned about. And so that really was a real show and force, if you will, in terms of our community's concern about you know their continued military plans. Now you said um, Guam is considered a territory, so it's not it's not like a state. What what, what is its exact political status, and mm -hmm. and how does this um, how does this fit in with uh, laws around decolonization, etc.? Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a very important question. Um, and so Guam is our current political status is technically and formally an unincorporated territory of the United States. And so what that means is we are a possession of 
however not a part of the United States. And so as a territorial possession, residents of Guahan or my home island, um, we, while we carry U.S. passports, we do not have a vote for the U.S. president. We do have a delegate to Congress. However, that delegate does not have any true vote. So there is a symbolic vote, but if their vote is a tiebreaker or determines the outcome of a, a you know of a call for vote then their vote is null and void um, in addition to that we have limited federal funding uh, a gao report out of congress reported that territories receive about one-seventh the funding that's afforded to states and we also are excluded from a number of different social service programs that are available to states for example um, unemployment insurance and so different safety nets economically uh, which also includes social security for disability um, we're not able to access those programs. And then the United States can unilaterally decide as well um, to implement policies that it wishes. And so, um, for example, there is a, a federal territorial policy called the Jones Act that applies to our island and as well as specific arbitrage laws that really inhibit sort of the viable uh, development of an economic base for the island. So those are just some examples of what it means to be a territory of the United States. And of course, ultimately, the deferral of our right to exercise our self-determination and become independent of them. Has there been any attempt to, to, to place this on the agenda of the United Nations Decolonization Committee? Absolutely. So from the original list of the United Nations Decol Committee in 1960, our island has been listed as a non-self-governing territory. We continue to be on the list and there's, when the list was originally established, there was well over 100 colonies in the world. Now there's just 17 of us left and so Guam is one of those. Um, our neighboring island in Micronesia have been afforded the opportunity to go through a decolonization process. Our island, which is the largest landmass in Micronesia and also the one with the most uh, material resources, is the one that hasn't been, largely because of the presence of these bases and the geostrategic importance of the island to the U.S. Department of Defense. The U.S. US authorities have argued that, that somehow the local people benefit you know, economically from the presence of the bases. Mm -hmm. um, but what is your estimate of the balance of costs and benefits of the presence of the bases? That's a very important question. And at its very peripheral face value, you know, what is um, circulated, particularly by the media and the Chamber of Commerce on our island is that the military buildup will infuse economic development. Um, and for sure, there are some companies that will make lots of money from the military buildup. However, as citizens and you know, my capacity as a social worker, what we really need to do is to be able to take a more holistic lens as we look at the economic impacts. And when you weigh in, for example, you know, looking at the cumulative economic impact. So for example, the number of actual military troops who are being transferred to Guahan is just under 5,000. So the needs of these 5,000 will be primarily provided for in the base, right? On behind base gates. However, in connection to this relocation is the construction. And so the construction will entail the importation of almost 20,000 foreign labor workers. So when you look at the needs, the social needs of these foreign labor workers, for example, a hospital care, they're not going to be able to access services behind the military gates. They will be going to our local hospital. Our local hospital, you know, consistent with a very poor U.S. jurisdiction, is ailing. Um, it, it just recently lost its accreditation. I mean, I can go through a whole litany list of problems that we've had at our hospital. And that hospital will be expected to be able to meet those needs. And so you can't say that because a few um, businesses will make great money at a bar, you know, running a bar or, or um, you know, some establishment that military personnel will frequent is enough to de definitively say that there's an economic, you know, positive economic benefit. One of the biggest limitations, of course, is that the military members will not be contributing directly to our tax base. And so in the absence of that, and for example, property taxes of the bases, right? We don't get any property taxes for one third of the land. So in that way, that's lost income to our government and its coffers. Um, so Really, in order to definitively answer that question, I mean, people need to take account of what are the expenses that come from our local government of Guam. And so two governors of, of Guam ago, 
um, a gentleman named Felix Camacho had said, and I don't know how much effort went into computing, but what he did say is that it would take Guam, the local government of Guam, a billion dollars to ready for the military buildup. So that for me is one, um, you know, one example of the quantification of what we would contribute. The other thing to consider is the fact that as they talk about this military boom or this economic boom, it is primarily, and this is based on DOD reports, it is primarily only during the period of the construction phase. So this boom, which will generate roughly $230 million, is anticipated only for a five-year period. And then it levels off after construction levels off. So when you consider the social responsibilities that our community will inherit by this increased population, and weigh that against this 235 million-ish dollars that we stand to generate, clearly it's not in our best economic interests. Now, um, are there differences in terms of social indicators uh, that reflect, um, you know, um, second-class citizenship, indigenous inhabitants of the islands? Mm -hmm. You know, when you compare it to the um, U.S. population as a whole. So the same negative social indicators that you would see in the Aboriginal communities here on, in Australia is the same classic colonial condition that you see with the indigenous people on Guahan, with the indigenous people of Hawaii, in other occupied territories. And so classically, and this is just off the top of my head, although I can show you the numbers, uh, when it comes to health indicators, cancer, for example, diabetes, um, heart disease, tomorrow's rank the top at all of those um, and so and what you find is overrepresentation in all of these social indicators so if Chamorros comprised for example the last census we comprised about 37 percent of the island's population then logically we should comprise 37 percent of all of these social problems but what we're seeing is the opposite we're ranking in the 80 to 90 percentile in almost each of those things which include classically domestic violence rates um, drug and alcohol use mental health outcomes of children, suicide, teenage pregnancy, um, incarceration, of course, because the worst case scenario, you know, they end up in jail. So our people comprise roughly 90% of incarceration at the, the prison systems. And so it's what I often refer to as a classic colonial condition, because after 300 years of colonization, we've really arrived at where you would think we would collectively in terms of of health health conditions and and, and health indicators um, is there a, a significant legacy of environmental pollution arising out of the, the military the military's presence and use of the of the island mm -hmm, absolutely and so the military themselves have had to um, reveal these reports. And so on, for example, in the Anderson Air Force Base, there have been numerated over 95 toxic sites on that base alone. Um, and so the status of those cleanups has transitioned over time, but um, there's some of them that have been cleaned up. There's some that have been in the process of being declared complete. Some were considered to be in long-term management. Um, some are currently undergoing clean up and some they're doing feasibility to studies to see whether or not it's even possible to clean up, right? So um, in addition to that, our island has or has had roughly seven Superfund sites, which are considered to be the most toxic sites in all of the United States by the US EPA, Environmental Protection Agency. And so while there's efforts for cleanup and most of those sites have uh, sort of a line number for cleanup because it's very expensive, as you know, to do this kind of cleanup. Um, so those are two very clear indicators of the, the impact on the environment. And in addition to that, of course, our island is within downwind of the Marshall Islands. And consequently, we also have exposure to radiation as a result of the nuclear tests that were conducted in the Marshall Islands between the 40s and the 60s. Is there a sense of an increasing risk of, you know, being a military target? Um, you know, uh, the relationship between the United States and China, um, the United States and North Korea, the DPRK, uh, I think the more readily uh, threatening risk that's, that is an example that most people can relate to is the threat of Guahan's safety uh, with regards to the DPRK. Um, one day we open the newspaper and the headline, or read the newspaper and the headline 
uh, states 14 minutes. And 14 minutes is reminiscent of how much time it would take from the time that a bomb is detonated in North Korea to reach our shores. Now, while our governmental leaders will say that, oh, we have nothing to worry about, you know, regardless of the threats, we're safe because the U.S. military's presence and its technology will be able to, you know, use its uh, essentially its uh, THAAD system to shoot down whatever bomb is headed our way. And so we don't have to worry. And so it really does call to question, well, then why, why Guam? You know, of all the military bases that exist, even in the Asia Pacific, why is it our base specifically that DPRK is targeting? And it's because, you know, the DPRK has never said that it would preemptively strike the United States. But should the United States decide to bomb the DPRK, that bomb will come from our Anderson Air Force Base, which is where the B-1, B-2 stealth bombers are housed and contained. So it's for that reason that the DPRK identifies Guahan. And so we, it's the same sort of um, classic experience of what we had in World War II, right? You know, the Japanese Imperial Army had no beef with the people of Guam and certainly not with our indigenous people. But because of the heavy fortifications of U.S. military bases on our island, we're a target. So, you know, oftentimes part of the rhetoric is that the military bases help to keep us safe. But we know that the contrary is true, right? Historically, we know that if, if anything, it actually creates feelings of insecurity. Now, Australia is, of course, the home to several U.S. bases or U.S.-related bases, and and you know they they they're actually planning to build them up here. So, um, how do you see the relationship between um, um, you know the, the the bases in Australia and the campaigns, uh, your people's campaigns, and and the. Uh, the campaigns here. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the U, the Department of Defense often uses a, a phraseology called interoperationability or interoper, and essentially what that means is that we are yeah interoper interoperability, <laughs> which basically means that across the bases they do various exercises and you know what have you maneuvers and things. And so, you know, um, since I've been here in Australia, there's been grave concern about the current legislation that's making its way through U.S. Congress um, that has funding embedded for projects in Darwin, for example, uh, for expansion of bases out there with the Marines. And so, you know, it really just shows our connectivity in terms of the complicity of, of this war agenda. You know, so um, in so many ways, and I, I think with what's happening at Pine Gap in particular, you know, it really just illustrates how um, small the globe has become militarily, you know, and um, because of Guam's location as sort of the a cornerstone of a number of different um, military theaters and triangles of uh, stages of of its exercises we really are kind of that connecting point you know Hawaii um, as the head of the Pacific Command is often uh, is referred to by many Hawaiian activists as sort of the he'e which is the octopus you know they're the brain and, and you have all the tentacles kind of spread across the Pacific and Asia um, and so it, in sort of a similar way, Guahan is sort of an extension of that in terms of its interoperationability to the rest of the region. So as far as you know, the, you know, the recently there was some publicity about um, a major military allocation being voted through by the Congress. Um, I'll tell you this much, the $224 million that's been earmarked for Guam's naval base expansion is something that's not even on our radar at all. You know, because we're putting out other fires with regards to the current development of the bases. You know, we've got very big concerns around the environment, uh, around our historical cultural artifacts that are being destroyed, essentially, in the construction project. You know, so much so that our governor had sent a letter to the head, the admiral in the Department of Defense who's stationed on the island, uh, requesting for a pause on the construction projects while we mitigate these concerns that we have for our artifacts, cultural and historical. And they basically have said, no, sorry, we're not able to do that. It's going to cost too much to the construction, you know, and them saying, no, I mean, what recourse do we have as a colony in that regard, right? Other than to employ on people power to to be able to um, get our, our views across. That even though the U.S. goes around the globe uh, with its sort of reason of democracy, spreading democracy throughout the world, that in its own backyard, in its own territorial uh 
you know, in its own territory, democracy does not exist.